Thank you very much for joining us today. Today we are joined by John, who is our Student Advice Service Manager, and he will be running through a presentation on how to make a student visa application from outside the UK. We are also joined by Rachel, Amy, Lisa and Kim from our student recruitment team, and they're here to answer all your questions. If you do have any questions throughout the presentation or afterwards during our Q&A session, you can just type them in the questions function and they will be aiming to answer as many as they can. So I'll just hand over to you now, John. Thank you. Thanks very much, Katie. Um, so I'm going to be talking to you today about how to make a student visa application outside the UK. And um, this is me. I'm John Hitchman. I'm the Student Advice Service Manager. Um, we have a small team who provide support with all the non-academic things you might need. So um, accommodation, um, finance, and, and in this case, immigration. So we give you that sort of support. We can provide that support before you come to SOAS. And we'll go into a lot of detail about this whole process. And um, the presentation probably takes about 15 minutes. And then we've got loads of time afterwards for questions about anything you, you want to talk about. So as well as the presentation and questions afterwards, we also have some very detailed online guidance that we'll send you a link for um, when we send you a recording of the webinar. So yeah, bear in mind it, it's being recorded, so um, you'll be able to go back over it. If, you, if there's things that you didn't catch, you can you have to re rewind later and, and watch it at your own leisure. But yeah, we've got the online guidance. There's a step-by-step -step guide to doing the online student visa application. And there's also a guide about documents. Um, we also have a guide about the immigration health surcharge as well, which is something we'll talk about in the presentation. So to crack on, um, yes, this is how you make the student visa application. We're going to cover how you do it, how, how do I apply for this visa, where can I apply for the visa, and particularly when should you apply, and then what documents do you need as well. And then um, a question that's probably one of the big ones is how much money do you need to show that you have in order to get the visa? And then we'll talk about whether you can bring your family members with you and get a visa for them as well. And then, as I said at the end, there will be plenty of time for questions. So who can apply for a student visa? So to apply, you must have accepted an unconditional offer at SOAS. And before you apply, you're going to need two things. You're going to need a CAS, which is a confirmation of acceptance for studies. Now, that's an electronic document that SOAS issue, but using the UK VI or UK government computer system. So this document will allow you to make the visa application, and it means we're confirming that you're a student and that we want you to come and study with us for visa purposes. And then secondly, you need to meet the maintenance requirements. So when you hear this word maintenance, what that really means is money. You need to show that you have a certain amount of money. We'll go into a lot more detail about that shortly. So how do I apply? You use the online application system. And there are things you have to do as part of this process. You have to pay the immigration health surcharge. Now, this is a charge. Oh, excuse me, hold on a second. This is a charge um, that allows you to access the NHS. Now, the NHS is our national health service. That means you can get any healthcare that you need except for a non-urgent operation. So everything else will be completely covered for the whole duration of your student visa. And that costs £470 per year of leave. So that's per year of the length of your visa, not the length of your course. Um, however, there's an asterisk there. Uh, and that asterisk is there because if you're an EU national and you have an EHIC card, so the European Healthcare Insurance Card, and that was issued in your EU country and you're applying for your visa this year, so after the 1st of January, uh, you may be entitled to a refund, but I think the important thing to bear in mind here is this is just for people who aren't intending to work while studying. So if you plan to do any part-time work at all, this unfortunately isn't going to apply to you, but otherwise you may be entitled to a refund. You can find out more on the gov.uk website 
um, you'll be able to claim that refund in January 2022, so in a few months' time. So you've paid the IHS, everybody's got to pay that, but you know, EU nationals may be able to get a refund. Then you also pay the application fee. So the £348 is the standard fee, and that will give you the 15-day service. So that is a processing time of 15 working days um, to turn your visa around. Uh, now, if you want to get your visa a bit quicker and you're happy to pay more, you can pay 568 for the five-day expedited service. This is available in most countries, but you need to check local services, which you can find online. Um, as part of the process, you're going to be uploading documents. And then you may have to attend a biometric appointment, and this is to provide your fingerprints and a scan of your face. And you may need to attend a brief online interview as well. Now, the interview is nothing to worry about. It's a very simple process. It'll probably just take 10, 15 minutes where you're asked a few questions about why you're studying in the UK. But the interviewing it will, will not be all students. And the biometric appointment will be applied to some students, but I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. And then depending on what country you've been living in or you, your country of nationality that you live in, you may also need to provide a TB test as part of your student visa application. Okay, so where can you apply? So you can apply, most people will be applying in their country of nationality or where you're living, and we've got living there in, in inverted commas. Um, so the idea is if you were in another country to that of your nationality, but you are perhaps there as a worker, so on a work visa, or perhaps you're already a student in a different country, a third country, not your home country, um, then that would, one of, a working or student visa or some sort of residence card would allow you to apply for a visa there. If you're just traveling or there as a visitor on a short-term tourist type of visa, you wouldn't be able to make your student visa application and you'd have to return to your country of nationality to apply. So at the end of your online application, you need to book an appointment usually, and that appointment will, will probably be to give you biometrics. And you can read instructions about how to do that. Now, some of these, these appointment arrangements may be slightly different due to the pandemic and how that's impacting locally to you. Um, so as I said, biometric appointment, that will be for some students and the interview appointment again is only going to be for certain students. And once your visa is issued, you're going to be getting a 90 day vignette. So that's a three month visa stamp in your, in your passport that allows you to travel to the UK. And it gives you a bit of flexibility in case you're having or facing any sort of delays because obviously over the past year travel has been quite quite messed up and, and I know things are getting back to normal for most people but in some areas you may still have some delays so the 90 day vignette just gives you a bit of flexibility when traveling to the UK and then once you're in the UK the vignette allows you to get into the UK once you're in the country you can collect your biometric residence permit and that's a plastic card with your visa details on it and you'd normally collect that from a post office, which would be near to SOAS in most cases. But the exception to that would be EU nationals who have a biometric passport. So you won't be attending a biometric appointment and you will actually use an app as part of the application process to scan your biometric passport and the biometric details will be taken from that. And instead of a vignette, a 90 day vignette, you'll be granted a 90 day digital status. So you won't be able to see your visa, but it will be attached to your passport. And if this is the case for you, if this is the kind of visa that you have, you need to keep some evidence of your travel into the UK. That's going to be useful for enrollment because you're not going to have a visa stamp or anything to show um, your the duration and period in which you could travel to the UK. Okay, so when should you apply for the visa? So you can actually apply now up to six months before the course start date. So you, you could really apply at any time from now. But it's important before you apply to make sure that you're, you're ready to do that. So make sure you have all the listed academic documents in your CAS. So um, if, for instance, you're coming to study a master's program at SOAS, uh, you've most likely done an undergraduate program somewhere else. Now, so as academically, we'd need to see evidence of that undergrad to give you a place on the master's. 
and there may be other things but that would be a quite a normal document um, you're probably going to need to upload a copy of that and in some cases you may need to show the original document at some stage as part of your visa application process and then the other thing that we keep coming back to is making sure that you meet the financial requirements but also having the correct documents to show that so uh, just having the money isn't enough you have to have the right documents that the UK government demand okay so what documents do you need so um, a valid passport we would recommend it's not it's not um, a requirement but we would suggest that you have a passport validity of six months just to allow travel flexibility so when you request your CAS if you've got six months left on your passport that's great um, you need your confirmation of acceptance to studies and you need qualifications that are listed in your CAS as well so um, we've covered that a little bit just now now proof of English language ability you're going to need to show that in order to get a place on your course here but actually, if, unless you're studying below degree level, you won't need to provide any evidence of that in your visa application. And then proof of maintenance, as we keep saying, is uh, showing that you've got the funds to support yourself whilst in the UK. That's the money. And then finally, you may be um, a national of a country that's listed as low risk. It's sometimes called differentiation as well. So if you're a low risk national, what that means is the UK government they don't want to see evidence of your finances or your academic qualifications when you apply for your visa. However, they retain the right to ask for them. So we would always suggest that you have those documents prepared and ready, but you just don't submit them in case they're requested. Because normally if documents are requested later, which they are sometimes, um, you haven't got a very long period of time in which to respond and get those back to the person looking uh, the caseworker assessing your visa. So a CAS, confirmation of acceptance to studies. So let's go a bit more detail into that. So a CAS can only be issued if you're an undergrad student, you need to affirm your unconditional offer. And if you're a postgraduate taught student, you've accepted an unconditional offer and paid the thousand pounds deposit. Um, you must inform the admissions team about any scholarships you've been awarded. This is so that they can be added to your CAS. If you have a scholarship that's being paid to you via SOAS, that money can be put on your CAS and it means you won't have to show bank statements to, um, to cover that amount. And the earliest you could use your CAS to apply, as we've said, is six months before the start date of your course. So if you're an undergraduate student, when completing your UCAS application, you would have indicated whether you need a student visa. And once you have a firmed offer, and it, uh, your firmed offer becomes unconditional, you can complete the online CAS request. Um, now, my understanding is if you didn't make it clear you needed a student visa in your UCAS application, you can still request one via the online form. And in your CAS request, you provide some supporting documents. So you need a colour scan of your passport. Everyone's going to need that. Evidence of scholarship, if you're, if you're lucky enough to have one. Um, evidence, is, evidence of tuition fees paid if applicable. So if you've already paid your fees to SOAS at the point that your CAS is issued, they can be shown as paid and then you don't have to show that money in your bank account or anywhere else when you're making your visa application and then your previous uk student visas or tier four visas that you've had in the past so if you've traveled to the uk as a student before um, the admissions team would like to see copies of those and finally if you're under 18 you'll need a completed parental consent form uh, completed by your parents and as I keep saying, we advise that your passport needs to be valid for at least six months when you request your CAS. And the deadline to request the CAS is 30 days before the start date of your programme. So postgraduate students, uh, it's quite a similar situation. To be assigned a CAS, you need an unconditional offer. You need to have accepted that offer, paid the deposit or provided official evidence that you've been awarded a scholarship or being sponsored by a recognized sponsor um, that could include your home government an international organization or company so if your sponsor is covering your full fees then you wouldn't be required to pay a deposit you could just show that they're, they're going to be paying for your tuition at SOA and to go into a bit more detail about postgrad students to be assigned a CAS 
uh, you're going to need to complete the CAS request form online. And in the CAS request, it's similar documents to undergrad. So you're going to need a colour scan of your passport, evidence of a scholarship if you have one, evidence of tuition fees paid if applicable, um, previous UK student visas if you've travelled to the UK before, parental consent form if you're under 18, and as I like to say, uh, we advise that your passport needs to be valid for at least six months before you request your CAS. And the deadline again is 30 days before the start date of your course. So that's the deadline to request your CAS. And admissions will send your CAS by email. Please check the details in your CAS statement. If there are any mistakes, please contact CAS request at soas.ac.uk to get those amended as soon as possible. Okay. So we've talked about CASs, low risk nationals, I think it's time to move on to the next slide. So finally get to the, the, the money bit. So how much money will you need to show? So your programme is longer than eight months. Um, you're going to need to show £12,006 for maintenance. So this is the amount that the UK government say that you need to live in London for nine months, but it's actually the amount you need for any period over eight months. And if your programme's shorter than eight months, then you need to show that you have £1,334 for each partial month or each month or partial month. So if you were studying a programme that was, say, six and a half months long, you'd need to show £1,334 times seven months. So as well as that, you need to also show that you have the full fees as well as the maintenance. Uh, as I said before, the fees could be shown as paid on your CAS and then you don't need to show that money in the bank if they're fully paid or partially paid you need to show the rest of that money in your bank account or in some other form perhaps sponsorship or loans now if you have a sponsorship or scholarship or a, a an educational loan that doesn't cover your full um, living costs and tuition fees you may need to balance out the difference with money in your own bank account or if you are just paying funding yourself or your parents are funding you then all that money will need to be shown in a bank account. Now, the account can be in your name or a parent's name. If you're going to use your parent's account, you're going to need written permission from them. That could be a very simple letter. It doesn't have to be complicated. Just signed, signed and dated by your parents, given permission for you to use the money. And you'll also need to provide your original birth certificate confirming your relationship. And the money must be held in the bank for at least 28 consecutive days before the date that you apply. And the 28 day period must end less than one month before the day you apply. And when we say the day that you apply, what we mean by that is the day that you pay for your visa fee online. So that's your application date, not the date that you maybe go for, for an interview or anything like that, even though that may feel more like the application date is the day that you pay online for your visa. So can you bring your family with you? Well, um, you can if you're a full-time postgraduate student on a programme that's over nine months in length, or if you're a government-sponsored student and the programme is longer than six months. And family members would include your husband, your wife, your civil partner, unmarried partner, or child under 18. And the maintenance, the finances, you need to show that you have some funds to support that person or that they have their own funds if they're an adult but the amount is slightly less. So it's 7,605 for a programme over eight months or 845 pounds per month if the programme is less than eight months in duration. Okay, can I book my accommodation now? Um, yeah, you can. You can apply as soon as you have a firmed offer uh, and you can apply via the SOAS accommodation webpage uh, and after viewing the options that are there. You'll, re you'll receive an offer of accommodation and a short time limit in which to accept it. And then you'll need to pay a deposit and this varies between providers. And you can, um, if you're a first year, your, your accommodation is guaranteed. So um, it's a good idea to start looking for that now. And um, contracts start in September. If you have any questions about accommodation, you can contact my colleague, Joe Hogan, our accommodation manager, and her email address is accommodation at soas.ac.uk. So once your visa is granted, you've been through this process, done the online application, provided your documents and 
biometrics and other stuff that you have to do. It's important that you check that the details are correct. So you'll usually be receiving an email that confirms your visa. And I think an important thing to remember is if you're doing a degree level program, so if it's undergrad degree or above, you should have 20 hours of week, uh, 20 hours of work per week allowed. So that should be clearly laid out on your visa email. And then if your program is a year long, so 365 days or more, you should have four months of visa validity after your course end date on the CAS. So check that in case any errors have been made. And if your program is between six and 12 months, you would get two months after the course end date. Um, the easiest thing to do would be to report this error to your visa application centre as soon as you see it. But if you don't notice this until you're in the UK and when you, if you pick up your BRP, then um, you must report an error on your BRP within 10 days of receiving it. And then once the visas are all OK and you're ready to travel, then please just check um, travel arrangements to the UK. Obviously, coronavirus is still having an impact, even though things have greatly improved um, in the United Kingdom. So before you leave, um, check this website, gov.uk border control. We'll, we'll send you a link to this. And I think the key things to take away are that everybody that's flying to the UK or traveling to the UK must provide a negative COVID test taken three days before you travel. And you also need to complete a thing called a passenger locator form, which just really gives your UK address on arrival and, and other contact details. And then we have a sort of color coding system, depending on where you're traveling from. So if you've been in a country or countries in the 10 days prior to traveling, the countries are coded as follows. So there's a green list of countries. So you could arrive in the UK, but you must take a COVID test on day two after you arrive. OK, that's what you have to do from a green country. From an amber list country on arrival, you must quarantine in the place you are staying. So that could include your university halls. And um, for two weeks, you need to stay there. And then if you arrive from a red list country, you need to quarantine in a, in a government hotel. So you have to pay for that and also take two COVID tests during that period. So it's a really good idea to have a look at this now to get an idea of how your travel plans might be looking. Also, please bear in mind these things change quite frequently. And, you know, in general, things are improving. But, you know, keep your eye, keep your eye on this web page regularly for, for updates. OK, so that's pretty much the end of it. Not quite, but sort of been through the whole process now, once you've followed our guidance, um, you know, use the resources, it sh you should find it fairly straightforward, get your visa, plan your travel, and we look forward to seeing you at SOAS, that'll be brilliant. Um, and then once you've done your degree, we have a new visa that's, that's actually starting in about two weeks time called the graduate route. And this visa will allow you to stay in the UK after you've graduated or after you've finished your degree to work for two or three years after your programme. And um, if you're if you're studying to qualify for this, you need to be studying a degree program, so an undergrad or postgrad or research degree. If you're doing an undergrad or postgrad taught degree, you can stay for two years. And if you're doing a research degree, then you'll be able to get a visa for three years to stay and work. And the visa would allow work for any employer. It's not sponsored by an, a particular employee. You don't have to have a job to get this visa. So you can apply once you've completed your program. And if you have dependents in the UK, um, they could also apply with you. So details are still to be confirmed. We're not exactly sure of all the fine, fine tuning, but we know it's going ahead and we know it's going to be running for the foreseeable future. So um, that's the end of my presentation. Thanks for listening. And now it's time to um, open the floor for your questions. Thank you. Thanks for that, John. So um, the team have been answering questions as we've been going through the um, through the event today, and we will continue to answer more questions. So do feel free to pop as many questions as you would like into um, the uh, the questions box. I will go through a few questions that I could see were occurring questions, um, and so it might be helpful to everybody. And we have put all the answers for everybody to see, but um, I think it might be worth going through some of them. Um, with you um, through the audio. So I think one of the main questions that we had come up both in this session um, this evening and also in the earlier session today 
um, was can international students come to the UK if they are coming from a red list country? Um, so I know that there has been a little bit of confusion about this. I think when you read uh, various different websites or um, different media outlets, um, but as a student, you will have a residency status. So you can come to the UK um, if you're coming from a red list country. Uh, what it will mean though, is that you do have to um, quarantine. And at the moment that quarantine would need to be within a um, government recognized hotel. Um, as universities um, across the UK, we are lobbying to see if it would be possible for students to um, quarantine in their university accommodation or in other accommodation that they have chosen. But at the moment, uh, the rule is that you would have to quarantine in a government um, recognised hotel. Um, but it does mean that you can still come into the country um, and it does mean that you can still apply for your visas to come to the UK. Um, another question that we've had that's kind of connected to that is what if um, you don't want to come for term one or what if you can't travel to the UK in term one um, through any number of things like delays in uh, visa processing or um, it could be just in terms of actual travel with um, flights. Um, it could be that you are a high, you're in a high risk category, so you don't want to travel currently. Um, so the university's policy on this is that for term one, everything that we offer in person, so that's the um, seminars and the tutorials, um, which are small group um, teaching, we will also offer an online version of that. And so from the university's perspective, it is possible for you to join us after term one um, for term two. What we're just waiting on is some further guidance um, from the UKVI on what that means for your visa processing. So we're just waiting for them to give us the last possible date that you can enter into the UK um, to start your programmes. And we will be communicating that out to all the students as soon as we have that. And we're, we're hopeful that we might get that update uh, before the end of June. And that leads me on to the next question, uh, which I know many students have posed both here and also through um, the other um, channels that we have, such as our um, Facebook offholders group. Um, and that is that we have made the decision to process um, all the CAS requests um, from the 1st of July. We will definitely be processing, processing all the requests from that day. If we get an update from the UKVI earlier than that, then we will also start processing them earlier. But that allows us to, one, make sure that um, all of the information we have from the UKVI is as up to date as possible so that we're giving all of you the correct information and allowing you to make the right decisions in terms of when you'll apply for your visas. Uh, the other thing that that also allows is that um, uh, many students are still waiting for their final um, transcripts, for their final um, certificates, and that allows you more time to get those into us. And finally, um, a lot of the scholarships um, that are awarded are awarded towards the end of June and the start of July. So again, whether those be internal or external scholarships, that will allow us to include those into um, your CAS. And with the inclusion of that into your CAS, if they're ones that are um, internal, so through the university, um, we will be able to include them into your CAS um, if, you, if you know about the outcome of them before you've applied for your CAS. Um, but we'll also be able to include them after you've got your CAS. Um, but what we do there is as long as your CAS is not what we call in play, which means that you haven't actually started that process of applying for your visa, um, then we can update it with that information uh, rather than giving you a whole new CAS. So uh, we can update that information. So those are just a few of the questions that came in through the chat. I'm just going to scroll through and see if there is any others. Um, I think, John, there is actually quite a few students who were asking about um, applying for their visas from the UK. So uh, we have a student who says, um, that they're already doing um, a previous qualification in the UK. We have another student who notes that they are currently on a dependence visa in the UK. Um, and then we have one final student who isn't in the UK, but is in Switzerland um, and has been working in Switzerland um, and is wondering if he will have to go back to Pakistan to do his visa or whether he can do it from Switzerland. So maybe you can talk about where they're applying from and how that works. Yeah, yeah, thanks, Kim. Um, so I, I'll start with the Switzerland one first, because that's probably the easiest. If you're a Pakistani or a non-EA national, but you're in, in, a, in a, well, 
if you're in, a, in another country with a visa to allow you to be there to do anything other than be a tourist, so if you're working then, you have a work visa, then you should be able to make your student visa application in Switzerland. It would only be if you're there as a tourist or a visitor that you, you, you'll, you'd be stopped from applying. So I think that should be pretty straightforward. Now, if you're already studying a degree in the United Kingdom and you want to make your visa application here, that gets a little bit more complicated, but I'll try and do a sort of broad overview to cover the situations I can think of. So if you're studying an undergraduate program at the moment, essentially we have a thing called, um, well, it's what the UK visas and immigration called academic progression, and it's a, it's a bit of a misnomer, but what it really means is they want to see that you've completed the course for which your current visa was granted before they'll let you apply for a new student visa in the UK. So if you're doing an undergrad somewhere um, outside of SOAS and you're planning to come to SOAS to do a master's degree, if you get your undergraduate degree results before you start the course at SOAS, then you can apply for your visa um, and you, you know, essentially you meet the academic progression requirements. Now, if you're coming from somewhere else and perhaps you're already doing a master's program and then you want to come to SOAS to do a second master's, now, it may be possible to justify that. I think that's OK if it, if it sort of fits in with your career plans. So, so that's acceptable to UKBI to stay at the same academic level in that instance. But for you to make your visa application in the UK, because you won't have completed your master's degree if it, if it runs the same sort of period as ours, September to September, um, you're usually going to need a letter from your university that says you are highly likely to complete your degree. Okay, now some universities are happy to write these letters and others are not. So um, this is, you know, if you know your results for your master's come out after the start of the master's programme at SOAS, it, I would suggest getting in touch with your current university as soon as possible for advice about that because if you can't meet that requirement, you will you will have to go home to make your visa application. So it'll be good to know that sooner rather than later. Great, thank you, John. And um, just related to that, um, that one of the comments you made there, John, is that and uh, this is another question that's come up. Um, a number of students have been asking us about final transcripts and final certificates. Um, we do realise that there are a lot of delays that students are facing this year with COVID, much like they did last year. Um, what we have allowed is that we can accept, um, as John kind of mentioned there, um, a provisional certificate um, and we can accept kind of final transcripts. So again, what it'd be worth doing is contacting the institution that you're currently at and asking them what they are able to provide you um, in lieu of a final certificate. Um, and then we would look at that and see as long as we feel that it shows that you have completed the programme and it shows the final grade that you've been given, uh, then we will be able to accept that in order to make you unconditional. So it's just a case of reaching out to your current um, your current institution um, and asking them what they are able to provide. Um, and similarly, if you aren't if you are expecting your results to come through um, in kind of uh, June, July, August, um, but you think there might have been um, some delays with that, or you hear um, in the next couple of weeks that there are any changes to that. Again, what I would do is reach out to us here at SOAS. Um, so if you go to our international pages, you will see that we have international recruitment managers for each region um, and their email addresses are on the website. So if you reach out to them and you say, um, I'm currently studying in uh, Indonesia and um, my school and particularly the school board uh, in which I sit won't have the results through until a certain date, then as long as we know that we can make preparations for that. So it's to try and keep us as up to date as you can. Um, all of our staff are already um, keeping up to date with what's happening in various different countries and also um, in various different provinces um, or regions of different countries, because we do realize that in some areas it can be done on a state by state basis or a provincial basis. Um, and so we are keeping as up to date with that as possible. And we we reach out to a lot of kind of joint um, associations to get that information. But it also helps if you are able to provide us with that as well. So if you think there are going to be any delays in your results um, or your final transcripts, just reach out to your institution that you're at and reach out to us with that information. And that will um, help us to find the best route for you in terms of confirming your place with us. 
Um, I think there's been a couple of questions about scholarships and how the visa process works for scholarships. So um, in most instances, uh, if you are getting a fully funded scholarship, so say I know there's been note here of the um, Alan and Nesta scholarship and also the Commonwealth Shared Scholarship, um, what normally happens with those scholarships is that once you have um, enrolled um, at the university, either um, online or in person, um, that enrollment serves as kind of the kickstart to you receiving those funds. Um, so many of the uh, many of the organisations, both internally and externally that we work with, they want to know that you've been fully enrolled in a programme before um, the funds are um, process. So what that means um, from a visa standpoint is that you may well have to pay the visa fees um, and any of the associated, associated fees with your visa application ahead of receiving your scholarship. And then once you have received that scholarship, um, obviously the money that you get in that scholarship will cover a range of different parts. So it could cover all of your living costs and all of your um, tuition fees, but you would basically take the money from what's given to you to use that. It normally isn't processed in advance of you making your visa application. Um, let me just scroll down and see if there's any more kind of common questions. But as I can see, the team have been answering the questions um, uh, in the chat for you. So hopefully you're finding this um, useful. Uh, so I can see a few people have noted um, about the IELTS exam that um, they have an unconditional offer, but they haven't taken the IELTS. Um, in terms of SOAS, uh, we have a range of different ways in which we assess um, students' English language ability. Um, and as a um, sponsor, we are able to um, accept uh, other English language qualifications as long as we can justify how we believe that you are showing your English language ability within that. So you don't necessarily have to have an IELTS in order to be able to um, go ahead with your visa application, as long as the university feels that the um, CELT that you have taken meets our requirements and we have included that into the CAS for you. So um, I think we've had a few more questions about the CAS. So just to reconfirm that, um, we have started, we did process some CASs earlier on. Um, so if you apply for your CAS before June 1st, we already processed the CAS request that came into us or kind of in the final stages of producing those CASs. If you um, applied for your CAS after June 1st, you will have received an email from us which stated that we aren't processing the CASs until July. And so we are now looking to process all the CASs um, requested from after June uh, 1st in, from the 1st of July, because we're just waiting for that visa guidance from the UKVI as opposed to what you would do if you want to come for um, term two or what the latest date that you could enter into the UK is um, based on the visa application. So uh, we will be updating you on that as quickly as possible. If we have an update um, ahead of the 1st of July, then we will start processing those CASs earlier on. Um, if not, we will definitely process them on the 1st of July and just give you what information we have at that point. Um, what I would say is that we are already um, getting the files ready. So if you've already submitted a CAS request and you've got that email notification, it doesn't mean that on July 1st, you have to put another request in. The request you've put in already will already stand. Um, and we are already preparing the information uh, for those CASs to, to process and send them out as soon as we hit um, July 1st. Um, so again, there's been a couple of questions about scholarships um, from institutions like Good Enough. So basically, if you provide us with information of the scholarships that you have been awarded, and we would need to see the final award, if they are scholarships that are external to us, um, then we can include that um, in the CAS, but also you'd be including that as part of your visa application. So um, where we know ahead of time that you are in receipt of a scholarship and where we have seen evidence of that, we can include it. But also, obviously, that's something you need to think about including when you are making your visa application. So again, I think we've got more questions about applying um, for a visa if you're already in the UK. And hopefully um, John's uh, response has already answered that for you. Let me see if there's anything else. So just to clarify, um, it isn't CAS letters for your particular countries that aren't being sent out at the moment. We aren't sending out any of the CAS letters for any countries at the moment, unless 
you already had um, submitted your CAS request earlier on uh, during the year. So, and it's just so that we can get the final uh, or as much of an update from the UK VI as possible um, and have that ready uh, for you as well. And um, with processing times, the processing times for visas, um, depending on where you're applying from, can vary usually between um, about two to three weeks um, and eight weeks. Um, and eight weeks is really kind of um, the, the much larger end of it. Um, and that doesn't tend to be the case for most students. And there's also priority um, visa processing that you can do. So we've looked at the um, timeline and we do feel that that will still be adequate time for you to um, get get your CAS, uh, apply for your visas um, and be in receipt of your visas in order to come and start on our programme. So I think there's a couple of questions about how long it takes you to receive your CAS once you've um, accepted your unconditional offer. Um, so as I say, it's just about filling in the um, CAS request form on our website. Um, and once you've filled that in, as, as long as we're ahead, um, or sorry, as long as we're past July 1st, we'll get those processed out as quickly as possible for you. We do have a team who will be working on them. And as I say, they are already preparing the files for them. So we are um, very uh, positive that we will be able to get the CASs out to you um, very quickly and effectively once we hit July 1st. So again, I think there's a few more questions about, um, again, entering into the UK after term one. So this is this is the main thing that we're talking about here is that we as an institution are happy for you to start your course in person in term two and um, do term one fully remotely. Uh, what we're just checking with with the UK VI is what date they see as the latest entry date for coming in to start the programme and just making sure those two things match up um, as much as possible. Um, there always is a period of time where students can arrive into the UK um, after they've got their visas and that has been extended um, because of COVID so it's the 90 day uh, vignette but we're just making sure that all the information we give you is correct because obviously if you do apply for your visa say in um, say in July or August it might not that 90 days might not take you all the way up until that first um, couple of weeks of January so that's why we're checking on that for you. And all CAS requests, um, we are processing all countries together. So it's not like we'll process one country and then another and then another. We're going to process them on a date by date basis for all students who have applied for them. So not just based on which country you're coming from. Um, I think there's a few quick questions here that are, are not so much related to the visas, but are more related to, um, to scholarships. Uh, so um, I know that there's a couple of questions re with regards to the Commonwealth Shared Scholarship. Um, if you have an, uh, an offer with us, we have extended the deadlines to accept um, those offers to the end of July. And that's with um, various different scholarships in mind. Um, so it should be fine for you to um, await the confirmation of that um, in order to accept us once you know that you have been confirmed for that scholarship. I'm just going to quickly scroll through and see if there are any um, more questions that maybe it would be good for uh, John to answer. So let me have a quick look. OK, so, um, John, we do have a student who says I'm still a bit confused about the 28 day rule for finances. Can be this, can this be clarified further? Would you mind to go into it again, John, if that's OK? Sure, Kim, thanks. Um, so, yeah, if you're showing money in the bank, so you need to show say your fees are paid to SOAS and they're shown on your CAS then you need to show that for a, a program say a one-year program you have twelve thousand and six pounds in the bank um, to do that you need to hold that money for 28 consecutive days so you show a bank statement showing a 28 day period that you've held that money that balance has stayed the same or or over that balance for 28 days so it doesn't drop below that period for a 28 day period so it doesn't drop below that balance for a 28 day period. And that 28 day period that could finish the day before you apply or uh, pay online, or it could finish up to one month before that date. But if, you're, if your statements are more than a month old on the day that you apply, which is the day that you pay online for your visa application, um, they won't be acceptable either. So ideally, if you can now, get the money into a bank account it can be a savings account as long as you can access it 
but it does have to be cash funds. Uh, it can't be an overdraft. You can't use a credit card. You can't use shares or any other financial instruments. You know, it has to be money in the bank that you could spend if you wanted to. But ideally, if you could put those funds into a separate account, you know, allowing a little bit for currency fluctuation as well. If you know that uh, your local currency does does go up and down, you may need to put a little bit more in there just to allow for that. But essentially, it's a consecutive 28 day period that ends less than one month from the day that you pay online for your visa application. Great. Thanks. Thanks, John. Um, and then I think we've had um, another question that says, hi, clarification on the 90 day vignette. Is this connected to the start date of my course? Can I enter the UK up to 90 days before the start date? Right, thanks, Kim. So yeah, it's good. It's probably good to talk about that. So no, the 90 days is really designed for flexibility um, because of travel issues due to COVID. But the vignette, the earliest you could enter the UK would be up to one month before the start date, of your course, if you're doing a degree program of a year in length or more. So um, you you wouldn't be allowed to come into the UK any earlier than that, I'm afraid. But that should hopefully be enough time for you to get get here, you know, get comfortable in your accommodation before you start studying. Thanks, John. And again, that's why we're um, we're also looking at uh, January and we're kind of looking at that 90 day vignette that you have and obviously making sure that we provide you with as much helpful information on when to apply for your visa. Um, what, but what also, say, what, sorry, sorry to jump in, but what I would say about the 90 day vignette, if we find that we can allow um, study remotely for term one. So last year, people occasionally their 90 day vignette would expire and you could apply for a replacement vignette. So the, the vignette is a sort of travel document. You already have the visa, like the visa is granted, they give you the vignette. If the, if remote study is allowed and maybe your 90 day vignette expires in you know November or something like that, and you want to come in January and that's allowed, which obviously at the moment we, we're still waiting to hear. But if it is, you could apply for a replacement vignette, which it costs about £150. So it adds a bit of cost, but it, it doesn't mean your visa won't work. You know, your visa is still there. You just need to replace that that 90 day vignette. Yeah, exactly. So we're just kind of waiting to see what those options are for you. Um, so whether it is that you get a, a CAS, which is looking at you coming in January, or whether you use the CAS that you have in September, apply for your visa, get your vignette, and then get an extension to that. So that's why we're kind of being very careful in terms of um, what when we produce the CAS is, um, and also making sure that we're just as up to date as possible um, from our university side. Um, I think we've had a few students who've asked about um, English language requirements in regards to um, whether their degree that they took before will still be valid. So with regards to our English language requirements, um, if you've taken a undergraduate degree in the UK, um, or you've taken an undergraduate degree in the medium of English um, in another country, um, but it is um, clearly marked on your degree that that is in the medium of English language, we will accept that for up to five years. Um, so if you've taken that degree within a five year period, uh, then we will accept that um, as your English language um, requirement. If you've taken an English language test, and that English language test was taken more than two years ago, then you would have to retake the English language test. So um, there are different periods depending on whether you took a full undergraduate degree um, or postgraduate degree, um, or whether you've taken an English language test. And then John, there's another one on the finances here that just says, what documents specifically do we need to request from a bank to prove the financial part? Okay, I mean, yeah, I suppose the thing about UK visas and immigration guidance is it's very much based on, on the UK banking system. So what we have here and what they're expecting to see is a chronological statement. So that's a document that shows all the money that's come in or out of your account for that 28 day period. And I think in some countries that, you know, the bank system looks quite similar to the UK, in others, very different. Now, there may be other documents that are accepted. So for instance, um, in China, there is sometimes a document called a certificate of deposit, which does a similar thing, uh, but but doesn't have the balance and that doesn't have the day-to-day -day balance on there. But in general, a statement um, 
a day-to-day -day statement is is the the thing that's needed chronological statement but um we'll send a link round to our guidance and our guidance goes into a lot of detail about exactly what documents are acceptable and, and exactly how they should look I think a few students have asked if there is a vaccine requirement for the visa, which um, there isn't. Um, so we can answer that one there for you. And then maybe we'll have time for one more question. So let me just have a look and see. Um, so I do see that there's been a couple of questions with regards to um, working in the UK um, whilst you're studying. Um, so just to say with this, that you will still need to show the finances to fund your degree and your living costs when you're applying for your visa um, as opposed to showing part of the funding and then hoping to um, to work whilst you're studying and have cover some of the cost of living from that work um, it is possible to work whilst you study um, you can do up to 20 hours per week so usually we at the university don't suggest doing that many hours um, what i think you've got to do is see your either undergraduate course or postgraduate course as a full-time job in itself um, and then what I normally suggest to students is to do about 10 to 12 hours um, of work per week when they first uh, arrive and see how they cope with that workload and then possibly there might be times of the year where they have a heavier workload or a lighter workload and so they can do a little bit more casual work or um, a bit less casual work um, but what I would say is that that work that you do, it helps in terms of your comfort within the UK and it helps in terms of knowing that you have a buffer in terms of the cost, but it's still um, very much uh, suggested that you know that you have the money to cover the cost of your course and of your living costs um, pre-arriving in the UK. So to already have that down. Um, I don't think that um, you can fund a UK degree and your living costs in the UK from casual work that you would do as an international student. And so I do tend to stress that with students um, before they arrive, um, because that can lead to complications uh, once you are in the UK, or it could um, mean that you aren't granted the visa in the first instance as well. So you do have to think about how you're gonna showcase those funds before you arrive in the UK, and then anything you earn through part-time work can help um, to put your mind at rest um, whilst you're in the UK, it can possibly help you have a, um, you know, a bit more of a comfortable time in the UK or spend a bit more in the UK, but it shouldn't be there to fund your studies um, because I don't think that it's really, um, it's ever really going to fund your studies in terms of part-time work. So I think that probably brings us um, to the end of the session now. That's brilliant. Thank you so much, Kim, and thank you so much, John, for the presentation. You'll all be receiving this recording via email, and like John mentioned, that will also include a link to some more details um, and another guide for you. So hopefully that will continue to help to answer your questions. Um, if you have anything else you do think of that you want to ask or you need clarity on, you can email study at SOAS ac.uk and then we also have a live chat function on our website so you can just click on the question mark on our website and then speak to one of our advisors that way as well so thank you again um, to the presenters and everyone for coming and hope you have a good rest of the day thank you thank you and we will be providing for any of the questions that we weren't able to answer in the um in the chat box today we will be going through all of the questions um that have been submitted today and providing a follow-up um faq as well which will be included in the emails that go out to you so if you haven't had any of your questions answered um yet we will try and include all of them into the faqs perfect thanks kim take care everyone